When I was going through some old boxes of components recently, I found two circuit boards I fabricated over 20 years ago. They were for a technical course project I had to do, where it's my own circuit and board layout. Even back then, in the 90s, the course I was doing used archaic 80s software. They had a DOS PCB layout program called Smartwork, and what we would do is draw our circuit, I think just by hand, draw all the traces, drop in footprints, holes for the components. So we would print out the artwork on dot matrix printers in two times scale. And then because it's dot matrix, we would have to take a black marker and draw in all the copper traces just to make sure there's no gaps from the printing. Then it would be reduced back down one to one and the circuit boards were etched in an aquarium with ferric chloride. The way I ended up getting my circuit onto the copper, I used something I think I found in the back of Radio Electronics magazine, an ad for Press and Peel Blue, eight and a half by 11 sheets of iron-on transfer. So I had to take pictures of my artwork for both sides of both boards to a copy shop where they could use a laser printer. I gave them the Press and Peel Blue sheets and they would print it out in high quality. Then I would cut it to size, iron it on with a clothing iron, peel it off, and there would be etch resist material on the board. Then into the etching tank and it worked. So these were double-sided copper clad boards, no solder mask or anything. After the boards were done, I put them in a liquid tinning solution and tinned the copper. So 20 something years later, it's still not too bad. So considering these were for coarse projects, one of them is very straightforward. It's a power supply for plus and minus 12 volts and plus 5 volts. The other board is a telephone interface and this is not a standalone board. And it's also missing some parts and it's had all kinds of reworks. There's bodge wires here and there. So I'm going to see if I can remember what all this was about. So the AC would come in here, go to a bridge rectifier, and there's a missing capacitor here. I don't know where it went because it obviously was soldered in. Between the plus 12 to ground and minus 12 to ground, there was a 2200 micro capacitor for filtering. And then the positive rail goes to a 7805 regulator and a 7812 regulator. And the minus rail goes to the 7912 for a minus 12 supply. Input and output capacitors on each regulator, a power LED across the outputs to ground, and then the outputs were over here. The traces had to be made relatively big in order to make sure we could have a good chance of having them show up after the etching process. Even with the press and peel blue process, when peeling it off, it's possible that part of the trace would be thinner if things didn't go well with the iron-on process. So the traces are overly robust, but the thing worked. So back in those days, 5 volt logic was pretty much what was used hobby-wise and on the educational level, and then a plus and minus 12 would be good for op amps. To the best of my ability, just looking through the circuit board and trying to come up with a block diagram schematic combo just to show the concept, I have the AC transformer. This left half would go to anything to do with main supply. We're just going to look at the low voltage side. So there's two 12 volt windings. So when I connect these two windings in series, I take the center node as my zero volt reference. Then I send the entire series AC voltage, 20 something volts to the bridge rectifier. And then relative to common, I'll end up with a plus 12 or 13 volts and a minus 12 or 13 volts rail. So I wanted plus and minus 12 volts. So I used a 7812 for plus 12, 7912 for minus 12. There's a 2200 microfarad filtering capacitor from the plus rail to common and minus rail to common. Each regulator has its standard input and output filter capacitors. And I also wanted a plus five supply. So there's a 7805 with its filter capacitors coming off of the positive rail as well. And each rail has an LED to common as a power indicator for each rail. It was only ever meant to be a really basic circuit 
not drawing too much current, just something for low current digital logic and op amps. To test out this power supply for the missing 2200 microfarad capacitor, I found a 50 volt 330 micro, so I put that here for now. I'm not going to draw any load, I just want to see if the regulators work and if the whole thing powers up. So I have this center tapped AC transformer and it's coming to the original AC in. And since I can't test this board, it makes a good meter stand. So let's plug it in, see what happens. And the lights came on! So the red light is plus 5, green is plus 12, and yellow is minus 12. This green wire here is a common ground. So looking at the AC inputs, 13.4 per rail. And end to end is 26.7. Now DC. I don't remember what pin is what, I'm just going to have to look around. There's a 5 volt rail, minus 11.7, so that's the minus 12 rail, and plus 12, 12.27. Alright, after 20 something years of literally not being powered up at all, this original transformer and this power supply circuit board still work. And by the way, 20 something years ago, back in the days when I was doing this, between one and two years prior to doing this circuit board, is when I bought this Fluke 76 meter, still going strong. This board was a little more mysterious to me. I had to think about this one. So the same thing, it's got traces that are way thicker than they need to be. And looking at the shapes of some of these little copper islands and fragments and the lack of resolution on any text, that's basically the result of the combination of using a dot matrix printer for the artwork and the hobby level etching process. But again, it was over designed, so it ended up working as far as I recall. So being part of a course project, I made this as a phone line interface for an academic level prototype of a simple home automation remote dial-in access control center. Now this isn't a self-contained board, there's a control board that plugged in here, and that's where all the work was done. This is more just the analog interface. So when I was trying to follow this and reverse engineer what's going on, it's in three blocks. First, for the phone jack. These are in parallel. It's meant to just kind of act as a pass-through and this board can tap in. So if you normally had a phone on the phone line, you would plug this into the phone line and then plug the phone into this for transparent operation and this would just do its thing. So it looks like I had a mauve across the phone line for mild surge protection. And down here, this optocoupler is part of a ring detect circuit. I'll try to draw out a schematic slash block diagram of this later, but we have a ring detect and it will send out a ring detect 5 volt logic signal to the other board. And there's a missing relay. This is one relay. It's a 5 volt, well, it's a 6 volt coil that I was using it at 5 volts. I don't know why this one's missing. It looks like I permanently jumpered it across in the meantime. <laughs> and there's little test jumpers everywhere to isolate things for testing and measuring. So out of these two relay circuits, there's control signals that would come in from another board. And then there's an NPN relay driver right here for each relay. One of these puts a load resistor across the phone line to draw a loop current, which is the equivalent of picking up the phone off hook. If the phone line is ringing, the optocoupler circuit will notify another control board. The control board will activate this relay and take the phone off hook with this resistor. And then we have a 600 ohm to 600 ohm transformer suitable for phone line impedance matching which is switched in or out of circuit with this relay and allows us to have an audio path coming out to the control board. So I can't demonstrate this these days, firstly because I don't have a phone line. Secondly, I'm missing parts including the control board, but I can say that when demonstrating this for the course, we actually plugged it into a phone line in the lab in the school and from another phone line we would call this phone 
the circuit would see a ring detect, then the circuit would activate the relay to take the phone off hook to answer it, and then it becomes a manual process. We know that once the phone is answered and it's just going to be silence, the control board will activate this audio path and it will be listening for basically DTMF touch tone commands. So the user has to know there's no prompt audio coming out. Whoever called in presses any of the keypad buttons. On this other board, there was a DTMF decoder chip that would give, I think it was four bits binary signal out, which would tell the processor what phone button was pressed by the caller. Based on what button is pressed, the control board will turn on and off maybe other relays to control a light or something else. And if you press, I don't remember what, maybe it was star, that would tell this circuit to hang up the phone so it would disconnect the relay, putting the phone back on hook and be on standby for another ring signal. The control board, I used a Motorola 6811 on an evaluation board, which was part of the academic program. I know I have that board. I think I actually have two of them here somewhere. So one of these days when I'm going through all these boxes in the basement, maybe I'll find those boards and maybe I can recreate this. But for now, I can't really demonstrate this so we can look at a block diagram style schematic. For the telephone circuit, I have the main phone line coming in and there's a duplicate copy to go back out if I want. There's an MOV metal oxide varistor across the phone line. This was just a quick bench test really so not likely that I would have had a surge event. If this were a real design I'd probably have some extra stuff in here including maybe one of those gas discharge devices that absorb any voltage spikes when there's an extreme voltage and it ionizes the gas inside the device, allowing a path for current, so helping protect everything here. The first portion is the ring detect circuit, so we're only interested in the AC ringing voltage, which I think back in the time I was doing this, I actually measured it about 90 volts AC. So there's a series DC block capacitor so that we only get any activity here on AC. And the LED in this optocoupler needs a series current limit resistor. And with this AC ring signal coming in, we want to protect the LED from reverse conditions. So there's a diode connected backwards across the LED to help protect that. So when there's a ring signal and the LED lights up, this transistor on the output will conduct, give us an active low signal for ring detect. Otherwise, this signal is pulled high to 5 volts. When the 6811 controller over here gets a ring signal, it will send a signal to take the phone off hook to answer the call. So we have a transistor that comes on, connecting a relay coil from 5 to ground, and that will close the contacts, bringing this load resistor across the phone line, establishing enough loop current on the phone line to pick up the phone off the hook. Now we want to be able to listen to audio touch tones coming in from the phone line, so the 6811 controller would turn on this relay with an audio enable, and when this relay coil is energized and this switch is closed, we bring in a transformer across the phone line with a series DC block capacitor. So now we have an isolated and impedance matched phone line friendly audio path that we can listen. And just in case we have a back to back Zener diode clamp circuit, just in case there's any spikes. So when somebody presses a touch tone button, the audio here is going to be picked up by a DTMF decoder chip it's going to tell the 6811 what button's pressed, and the 6811 will go and turn on or off a device. So I only have this board right now. If I ever find the 6811, maybe I can try to get this going. Of course, I'll need a phone line simulator as well. So that's great. Now I just need to figure out how to get this phone circuit working which is probably going to get me back into modem and old computer experiments. I still have to work on my phone line simulator thing that I started last year. It may take a while to get around to things, hopefully not a couple of decades this time, but I do have a long list of projects. Archaic, modern, simple, complex, trivial, useful, just need the time. So thanks for stopping by, sharing in some nostalgic circuitry. 
Hopefully this was entertaining and amusing in some way, if not educational in some other way.